All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Hope yeah. everyone's doing well this lovely mid March here in 2021. <laughs> I realize it's St. Patty's Day. That's why you're rocking the green, Beth. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I, I, did oh. that. I did that on purpose. Um, somebody reminded me this morning because I was not wearing green before I came on this call, and someone reminded me that if, if I had anybody in my house, I would get pinched. So I probably. <laughs> I promptly went and changed my blazer. <laughs> love it. Love it. You're protected. <laughs> That's right. I'm protected. <laughs> uh, I have green in my necklace somewhere. Hey, there you go. Right, right there in the center. Yeah, right I like there. it. That it's counted. Good. <laughs> yeah, now you can't pinch me. No, no pinching allowed. <laughs> I purposely don't wear the green, so I do get pinched. So <laughs> <laughs> I do it the opposite way. Uh, Jules, I think you subconsciously like that. <laughs> so, so, all the attention. Yeah, that was inappropriate. Okay, sorry, HR leaders. That was not appropriate. Because <laughs> today yeah. we're supposed to socially distance. You yeah. Know. I know, I know. That's and you want to know what's really funny? Uh, I want to let you know, Beth, I live, I currently live part-time in Mexico. So I'm in Puerto oh, Vallarta. Awesome. And, and, and what's really funny is that in the United States, it's a six foot social distancing in Mexico. It's a five foot social distancing. Oh, yeah. oh. So apparently they're shorter here. <laughs> we have a, <laughs> we have that uh, closer personal space. So it's like, yeah. uh, instead of getting this I close on an old basis. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway i moved back to colorado at the end of april oh okay. wow awesome well you're missing the snow i know look at this uh -huh. <laughs> smart yeah. i went I sailing you. yesterday as you guys were digging out of your snows yeah <laughs> no more no more crocodile chasing adventures i figure the crocodiles probably couldn't swim out in the middle of the bay but yeah. I could be wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, Scary. I'm I'm avoiding the crocodiles, although there are crocodiles in the marina. So you gotta Whoa. make sure not to jump in the marina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get eaten. That's great. That so, was last that was last week's story, Beth. <laughs> that was last week's. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, you had to you had to look at the recording to get the charge full story on the cro crocodile chase. Oh, <laughs> that's so scary. <laughs> yeah, that 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 one I would be like coming from Australia, like they're they're aggressive little critters. So uh -huh. I, I don't play with alligators, you know, they just kind of like whatever, but crocodiles, no, run. <laughs> run away. I love it. All right. All right, we are at the top of the hour, so we should uh, get started and, and uh, say welcome to all our, our guests that are on. Yes, all right, everybody. Hopefully you ready? enjoyed our, our little crocodile story. We always like to try to keep it fun and alive and like have some fun stories. So well, I can also <laughs> talk about the geckos, but we'll save that to uh, next, the gecko <laughs> next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everybody. Uh, no matter where you're tuning in from, we welcome you. We're really excited to have you here at the People Strategies Forum. This is something we run weekly, so we definitely encourage you to show up each and every week. We always have a wonderful speaker presenting on a different topic, so there's always something new and exciting to learn. So I definitely encourage you, if this is your first time here, keep on coming back because every week we have a lot of fun and a lot of great speakers. So. I want to officially welcome you to the People Strategies Forum and to give you an idea of what it is, it's a mastermind of leaders. We're dedicated to creating workplaces where people thrive, where employers reward and customers love. Nothing better than that. So my name is Jules and I'm going to be introducing everyone. And uh, what I do is I'm an on-camera and video coach. So I help people shop confidently on camera, which, you know, we're all on camera these days, whether we like it or not. So um, I help with that. And I'm also going to be off camera during the presentation, looking for any questions that you might have. So we really want to encourage you to 
ask any questions you might have for our speaker or any of our panel as well, um, because we will get that answered for you. And if you are watching from a different platform, let's say LinkedIn, ask, ask your questions there as well, because we will get to those after the session. All right, so we won't forget about you. And now to uh, introduce you to our other amazing hosts, we have Shah, and she is a people strategist. She's an HR expert. She runs her own company. She's in Puerto Vallarta right now. So uh, she has a wealth of experience in many different areas. And we also have Sam, who is the founder and CEO of Comp Team. And if you need help with talent strategies or compensation programs, Sam and his team are the people go to people for that. And uh, he's the reason why we have the People Strategies Forum as well. And that's our panel. And I'm going to introduce you to our speaker for today. We're really excited to have Beth Smith here with us. I mean, look at her smile. She's just radiating such good energy and good vibes. I love it. And a little bit about Beth. She's a business consultant. Uh, she helps businesses hire, interview and hire people. Um, and she also teaches new and innovative and effective ways to interview and hire people because you know if if you have ever interviewed someone or a, a, you know it's for a team you know it's a big process and uh, I actually really love that you're revolutionizing this because it's about time Thank someone you. came in and changed this you know old way of doing things so uh, Beth if there's anything else that you oh and you're also on your uh, third book you're writing another book Correct. I am. Yes. Yeah. So the first book was um, "Why Can't I Hire Good People," which lays out my seven-step process, and we'll get into a lot of that in the uh, webinar today. And then my second book is called "Higher Power," um, and that is a daily. Oh, there it is. There awesome. it is. Um, yes, that's um, the higher power is daily tips and insights for how to con um, to hire better. And so why can't I hire good people lays out the whole strategy and the seven steps and then higher power is a daily reminder and daily tips and insights. So it can be read more as a daily journal than as a uh, book that you read straight through. So awesome. And yes. actually, the, t the title of our presentation is actually why can't I hire good people. So right. really excited to have you here. Thank I'm going to give you the floor. Welcome Beth. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you my story about how I got involved in this uh, work that I do. And, um, and then after that, really, I'm going to open up the floor to anybody who wants to ask any sort of difficult hiring question. I am your girl. Um, I owned a restaurant in Boulder, Colorado. I hired a guy to help me manage the place. He let in two underage football players. They were accused of a felony. This was one of the incidents in the Colorado football recruiting scandal and it made national news. Mm. So when I go in to speak to groups of people like yours, I always say to them, did your bad hire make national news? No, I didn't think so. Um, as far as I know, with all the speaking I have done to the thousands of people that I've spoken to, I'm the one that has made the single worst hiring decision of anyone else I have ever met. Um, the next day, the Boulder police officers walked into my restaurant and told me I was going to lose my license. I said, is there anything that I can, anything that I can do to change that? And I had a detective from the Boulder Police Department lean across the table, point his finger at me and say, you have to learn how to hire better. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. So I read every book I could get my hands on. I looked at universities for classes. I did not find resources. So then what I did is I called every single business owner, C-level executive, VP, and hiring manager in my network. And I said to them, I'm under direct orders from the Boulder Police Department to learn how to hire better. Can you help me? Not a single person said yes. <laughs> every person I talked to said things like, good luck with that. When you figure it out, come back and teach me. I'm selling my business after 30 years because I can't get the right people on the bus. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is a much larger problem than my little bitty restaurant, but I don't have time to think about that. Um, I need to find a way to interview people quickly, 
um, efficiently and be able to put them on the floor because in my restaurant, it was a 24 hours a day, seven day a week operation. So there were times that I would hire people and never see them again. Hmm. Meaning I work days and they work nights. So I went into this huge research project um, where I interviewed over a thousand people over the course of four years. And I went into this interview thinking one thing, I, in 15 minutes or less, what do I need to know about this person that would make me feel comfortable handing them my 18 month old daughter, the passwords to my bank account and the keys to the liquor closet <laughs> um, and be successful at it. Um, like I said, over the next four years, I interviewed over a thousand people. Um, I, in the last year of business, I had 0% turnover. Um, we sold the business. I sat on the couch for a year. I watched a lot of law and order. I played free sale on my phone. I'm very grateful that Facebook had not been invented because I'm not sure I would have ever started this business. <laughs> but then one day I woke up and I thought, you know, I've learned some things about interviewing and hiring and I need to go out and teach it. For the past almost 15 years, I've been doing this work where I go into a company and I teach them how to conduct an effective interview process. I've interviewed almost 20,000 people in my career, and I have a 91% retention rate for employees after a year. So that is my powerful story about how I got into interviewing and hiring. And please keep in mind, I have made the worst hiring mistake you have ever heard so far. Um, okay. What kind of questions do you guys have for me? Yeah, so that's quite a, that's quite a, uh, um, a story there, Beth. I mean, and, but, but also just the, the fact that you're, you're right now that you have such uh, this, this retentive ability when you, when, you, when you identify that person and they stay for so long is, is great, is a, a, exceptional. Thank you. I really so, appreciate that. But what I'm really interested to hear is about, I mean, how has hiring changed uh, in this past year, given all this craziness that's, that's happened in, in the marketplace? You know, what's funny is um, 2020 was the best year I've ever had in my oh. business. And I think what's happened is um, employers now are recognizing that how hard it is to hire people and they want to do it right my clients want to make good hiring decisions. Mm -hmm. They want to avoid layoffs. They want to avoid having to fire some, somebody. So I think there's a real big interest in how do we conduct effective interviews so we're hiring the best people possible. Um, what I have seen is um, a couple of things. Um, remote possibilities now um, for good employees, remote is amazing and they are effective and they're making their deadlines and they're getting the work done, etc. Remote for employees that are not good is increasing problems. So it used to be one thing to have a bad employee, but they were in the office next to you. So you could kind of keep an eye on them. It's another thing when they're remote now and they're not good and you can't keep an eye on them. Right. Mm. And so what ends up happening is people are firing faster, which means they're hiring faster and not necessarily hiring better or more effectively. So it takes longer, I think, to realize that a bad performer is on your team remotely than it is, you know, when we were all in the office together. Mm -hmm. um, from a recruiting standpoint, um, we're seeing a lot of um, issues with people that are applying to national jobs um, because they are remote. So now you have a lot of people that are out of state even. So it's not even just that they're down the road from your office. Now they're in completely different states. Right. So, and as I'm sure Shar can attest, the HR um, nuances of having employees in different states raises the stakes too. So um, it's, 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 been, it's been a really interesting year to recruit. Now it's very different from like 2008 when we had thousands of applicants for one job. I'm not seeing that now, um, even with the high unemployment rate. 
I'm not seeing as many applicants per job um, as I was in the past. So mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. been a really intriguing year. Well, yeah. I, I would absolutely agree with you, Beth. Um, also, just taking into consideration that there are significant employment law differences between the okay. states. Yeah. And, oh, and um, so your HR leader is, I, I, I have been an HR leader over 11 states at one point. And we had to hire an, an associate general counsel. You know, you have to have, sure. you have to have an attorney. Totally. Um, yeah. And if your if your executive leadership are unable to invest in a good employment law attorney, your HR leader is going to be set up for for failure. Mm -hmm. I would agree. So, so I totally agree with you. It's very it's very challenging and very stressful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the things that you mentioned, Beth, as far as the the, the numbers of candidates uh, applying to certain positions has, has actually decreased this year. Is there an explanation for that, or is there a theory of why that's happening? Um, I don't know that I would say that they're decreasing, but I would say that they are not as overwhelming as they were in 2008 and 2009. Okay. Um, now I still had a, um, I had one job. Um, it was an HR director in a company in Baltimore and we had over a thousand applicants. I mean like that. Um, so it, it, I think it depends on the state. I think it depends on the industry. I think it depends on, um, whether you're remote or not. So it's, it's, um, it's not necessarily that they're decreasing. It's just not as out of control as it was in 2008, huh. what I would say. Okay. Well, I, I know one of the past complaints that recruiters often have is that there's just so much noise in the marketplace that it's, it's hard to, to uh, uh, gain attention for your, your post and, and to attract people to your particular company and so forth. Are, is, is that a concern that, that is uh, are pervasive or is there still a lot of noise out there? So here's the deal about um, recruiters is they, in, and I am one, so I can say this, they really like to say that there's a shortage um, because that increases their value, right? So I think that that's a misnomer. Um, I wrote a paper called, Is There Really a War on Talent? And I hate that phrase. It came from a marketing firm in the 90s. So that should tell you just its, its origin, that it's an issue, right? But there are a billion more people in the workforce since the 80s, a billion more. So it's the numbers of people that are in the workforce are, are they're way higher than they used to be in the 90s when there was this so-called war on talent. I, I don't like calling it a war. That sounds violent. I don't like that term. Um, and I don't like the fact that we are sword fighting over some candidate. I think that's a bad perception for not only all hiring in general, but for recruiters as an industry. I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't believe there's a shortage. I think you only have to hire one. And I do believe you have to be strategic about it. And I do believe that your messaging has to be clear and, but I have no problem getting candidates or to the table. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, right? one, one, one thing I know is that there's, there's more remote jobs than ever in the, you know, in the, in the mm -hmm. market. And so the, the, the breadth of, of the people that your candidate pool is just exploded. Right. So yeah. there's, there's a lot more people. So how do you narrow that down to, to identify the, the, the right people to interview? That's a great question. And there's what I call the myth of the top five. So people will say, um, oh, Beth, just send me your top five people. Hmm. Well, the problem is my top five people are maybe not Sam's top five people and they're not Char's top five people, right? Because we're all looking for somewhat different things. So what I recommend is instead of only spending time with five people that you're interviewing, because when you interview someone, if they walk into the door, there are times, and I know you know what I'm talking about, 
you take one look at them and you think to yourself, I wouldn't hire you to walk me across the street, much less come in and do this job. And you know that within 2.5 seconds. Okay. So now you've allotted an hour interview and now you have 59 minutes and 57 seconds to do something with this candidate that you know, you're never going to hire. So I, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you. Are, are you talking about the, uh, oftentimes we have the person that does the pre-interview and then, and then we have a pit more of a kind of a panel interview. So are you talking about the pre-interview person? So it's interesting because um, they, there's this, um, what they call a screening interview. Right. And I don't believe in those. Um, oh. And I, I don't believe in those because the person who's doing the screening is usually screening for a different criteria than the panel. Hmm. And so my at, what I advocate for is a shorter interview with the whole interview team a shorter interview with more people rather than a longer interview with less people in the beginning. So my first interview is 15 minutes long. And I ask the same seven questions in the same order, every single candidate for every single position, but the entire interview team is present for those interviews. So is because that like a Zoom, a Zoom or a, obviously an online Type of um, I do. The first interviews are over the phone. The second interviews are Zoom or some sort of video conferencing tool. And then the third interview in my process has to be in person. Okay. And the reason I advocate for an in-person interview at some point is, uh, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, the amount of C-level executives that I have interviewed that have shown up drunk or on something or can't form a sentence or can't show up on time or can't present well or whatever the case may be is alarming. Hmm. So I don't ever hire somebody that I have not sat across the table from. That's great advice. So would you say that the, the, the phone call would include all the panel people? Yes. Yes. And here's why. You cannot compare apples to apples unless all the apples are in the room. That's true. So when you have, so in general, and this is very normal, Char, for, uh, for all of the companies that I work with, their interview process before I started with them was a pre-screen interview with typically an HR person or a recruiter. A hiring manager has a skills interview, and then the C-level executive has the final interview or the team has the final interview. The problem with that is everybody is evaluating different criteria in different ways. So mm -hmm. what I advocate for, everyone sees the same information because how do you compare candidates and apples to apples if not everyone is in the room and here's the same thing? Mm -hmm. So would you use, and you might get to this, um, do you use a, a, a form that everybody has, like an actual document? A uh, form for what? Like a seven so, step process? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying all the five people on the panel have the same form, a consistent form. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so is, there, and is it like a rating process? No. It, no, okay. It is an analysis of their answer. Okay. And it's either, it's pass fail. They oh. either answered it correctly or they didn't. Okay. Well, that so makes it's all it based easy. on the candidate's responses. Okay, that makes it easy. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jules, you, I, I think Jules is trying to interrupt me and tell me something. No, yeah. it's okay, because um, we were, yeah, I think, um, Nushkin, is this um, answering your question? Because the, the question was what your process is based on your learnings. Uh -huh. so I guess that oh. kind of went through that, but I was trying to figure out if um, they meant uh, like in the interview itself, but no no reply. So, but I guess that that kind of, you're, you're going through like who who's seeing what, who's doing what, you have the mm -hmm. same kind of, recipe as Daniel put it. <laughs> yeah. So the recipe, Daniel, is seven steps. And the first step is creating an ideal list. So if you could have anybody in the world you wanted for this position, who would they be and what would they know? And then my job is to create that ideal list. Um, and then we have a job description, which usually the company has that I'll review. From those two documents, I write the job ad, 
The step number four is I post the ad. We screen the resumes on behalf of the clients. And then we have a first interview, second interview, third interview, and that's the seven steps. Now the okay. first, second, and third interviews are all varying lengths, lengths of time. And then the, each interview has a separate question that you're trying to answer. So the first interview is all about conflict resolution. There's two types of conflict at work. There's conflict with your boss who can fire you. There's conflict with your peers who cannot. Hmm. If you, if your candidate cannot manage their own conflicts at work, then you have to do it for them. And now you're not running a business, you're running a daycare is what I like right. to tell people. Okay, so so-and-so comes to you and says, oh, my peer, she's not doing her work. She's got more work or I've got more work than she does and blah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, I mean, it's literally a bunch of three-year-olds that you're having to manage, right? The difference between managing and leading is managing means you have to solve problems for people. When you get to lead, you present problems and they solve them for you. That is the key difference between management and leadership. Mm. So the goal is to hire people who solve your problems for you, not vice versa. Correct. The first interview is all about conflict resolution. The second interview is can they do the job we're asking them to do? So it's all about skill sets. Mm. And you know, if you are hiring a lawyer, then are they good at legal work? Are you hiring a CPA? Are they good at C, you know, CPA stuff? Because I don't know anything about that. Um, <laughs> If you're hiring an engineer, are they good at engineering, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then the third interview, which is the most telling in my opinion, the third interview is do they love the work that you're offering? Hmm. If they don't have a resounding yes on all three interviews, it's never going to work out. And I'll give you an example. We interviewed a C-level, I mean, no C-level, a senior level electrical engineer and he was such an Eeyore. Oh, yeah, I've done that. Oh, yeah, I've solved that problem. Oh, yeah, I've run into that kind of client. Um, and I kept, he had been an electrical engineer for 20 years. I kept waiting for some sort of enthusiasm to come about. And finally, I asked him, I said to him, if you could have any job in the world you wanted, what would it be? And he literally went like this. He was sitting like this. And all of a sudden he went, I would be a ballroom dance instructor on a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> we did not hire him. Uh, he does not love engineering. He is not going to solve problems. He's going to create more problems, even though he's done this work for 20 years. Right? So if they don't love the job they're offering, then you let them go. I'm hoping that he is somewhere on a cruise ship, please, before the pandemic teaching ballroom dancing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, have you noticed though that Eeyore always has lots of friends? <laughs> because and they're it, doing it, his job for him. Yeah. That's why. So they always inv invite them to the little, the little parties. They do. <laughs> and please nail my tail back on my you know, tush huh? back there. Huh? Right. I mean, it takes a yeah. whole team to keep his tail on. That's but, Eeyore. But you absolutely are right. I mean, we, I think if, I mean, I've managed teams of 159,000. Well, I didn't only do that. I have my own little group, but yeah, 159,000. And, and there were probably 30% that could be considered Eeyores or Debbie Downers. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah, and it's like, once they're in your company, and particularly if you're in a union company, that's even more problematic. No offense, Agreed. Ian, but that's a problem. So if you're hiring the wrong people, it's hard to, to handle those yours. Good point. Right. So just, I know we have an international audience. So if anybody doesn't know who Eeyore is, it's a character out of the Winnie the Pooh series. It was written a long time ago, but, it, but uh, uh, adorable. But the, the one thing I wanna bring out is, is that your seven step process and then the three interviews. Now, I know out of the uh, Laszlo Bach uh, was once the uh, leader at uh, HR leader at Google, 
uh, wrote the book uh, Work Rules, and in his book, he was mentioning that you know Google started off this 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 just huge detailed process. You know, I I, I like to think that Google. My, in my experience, I think Google kind of overdoes everything, at least at, at the beginning until they figure out the right mix. But that, so they had this huge process, this owner's process where they took people through like, I don't know, seven or eight interviews, uh, panel interviews and so forth. Yeah. And then and then they did. And, uh, and being the data geeks, they are. They did the statistics, st- statistics around it. Right. <laughs> yes. And and they they found that that after the third interview, the mm-hmm. probability of hiring the right person doesn't increase all that much with no, the right interview. No, it doesn't. That's so they're, yeah, they're, so we're just wasting people's time. So uh, yeah, so I, I'm I'm really happy that you've you've got that three interview process. I mean, having a, a I mean, having the the appropriate candidate experience is really important in this, right? And and being dragged along through all this time, it seems. It seems to generate a negative experience. What would you think? It does. And I'm going to, I'm drawing, I'm drawing something real quick to show you guys. Okay. So can you guys see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. So you have candidate A, B, C, and D, and this is their performance on interview one, two, and three. Who do you hire and why? Well, I'm I'm guessing it would, you know it'd probably be uh, C because they're 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 uh, they're performing pretty well on all the interviews. Okay. Uh, well, that, I think that's an excellent choice. I guess I would say I think D is is showing that that person's learned something from the interview okay. process, and and so it appears to me D is like progressing. Uh you know, unfortunately, that first interview was probably disappointing, but by the time they learned the process, they did very well. I guess that's that's one of my points. All right, hold on. I'm trying to find a different marker. Okay, let me show you the pattern. Oh. <laughs> so to your point, Char, Yes, they are improving, but at some point they're going to fall off of improving. Mm-hmm. Well, Sam, you're we're right, Sam. You're Sam so was smart. right. That's right. So consistency across the board, and what Jules said, C is for consistent. Good job, Jules. And so what you're looking for is consistency across the board. So remember, there's three interviews for three different questions, and it has to be a resounding yes on all three, or you're gonna end up with someone like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I love right? that. Yep. But, so, oh, go ahead, Beth. So to your point, after three interviews, um, and I see this all the time in the third interview, they really do let down and relax. Mm-hmm. And the reason that they do that is because they know that they are high up, like it's close now, right? They know that an answer is close. So they relax some. And when they do that, it's amazing to me how often they let down hmm. um, where they just don't perform well. They performed well the other two times. And then the third, I, I had a client, there's a quote in my book, thank God for the third interview. There's something so magical about that third interview. They either want it and it's very clear and they, it is very clear they're the right fit or it's, they fall off. And really what I encourage my clients to do, and part of the reason why I keep getting hired over and over and over, I think is because I tell them, "Uh uh-uh, we're not, we are not hiring somebody who let down on the third interview. We're not doing it because now you don't have a consistent pattern across the board of the interview process. So you don't know how they're going to perform. Mm-hmm. That, that's a really good point. And oftentimes you'll see a lot of arrogance and, and a lot of when? times that might, uh, I would say by the time you hit the third interview, if they think they're doing really well in the first two, huh. and then by the time they hit their third, you know, um, I, I, I've seen a lot of that in some of my um, interview experiences. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not, I mean, to me, that's a red flag. Totally. Mm-hmm. So, so it, it's hard to judge. 
you know, if you're going to do three interviews. Yeah. But what, what happens? I mean, there's, I mean, there's some people, so there's some people I noticed that, that interview really well, but then when they're out of the interview that you get a different experience or vice versa, they interview poorly and then they, they, they're great. So how do you, how do you flush that out? So eventually they let down. Hmm. So people who interview really well, there are holes that start to come up. Um, and people who interview well think that they're gaming the system. Right. Right. Like I had this woman one time, she was like, I can pass any interview that you put in front of me. And I'm sure she's probably right because she's not going into this in an authentic way. She's going into this to knock the socks off the people in the interview team and they get really excited. Um, and if you listen closely to her words, you will start to hear things that unnerve you. Hmm. And so when you're trying to pull the wool over someone's eyes, which is what a good interviewer wants to do, like if, if that's their goal to go in is just to land the job because, you know, it's, it's, I'm good at interviewing. Fine, do that. But the problem is they're not going to last. And so there's this delicate balance that my clients have with, they are dying to hire someone nobody likes interviewing the way that I do. I'm just a geek. <laughs> My clients don't want to sit around and interview people all week. I interviewed 52 people last week alone, right? Wow. I love that work. No one else loves that work. That, I'm weird. And so <laughs> they, they want to hire somebody. They're like, please. And they need the help, right? But at the end of the day, when you have someone who is trying to pull the wool over your eyes and they know it, my my, my clients are not stupid. They recognize it. What they have to do is talk themselves out of hiring somebody because they want to hire somebody and they need the help and they hate interviewing people. Right. That's the key. It's really not about someone who pulls the wool over their eyes. You're going to know. You're going to know. Somehow you're going to know, right? It's about talking yourself out of that person so that you can continue the search. Mm -hmm. That's well, where people run into problems. Let, may I ask you a question? Um, being an owner of a company and working closely with my CEO, he's a very impatient, which typical CEOs are. So about how much um, time would you say this process would take? Yeah, and it's probably the biggest disadvantage of working with me. Okay. So what I tell my C-level clients, because like you, like you talked about with your CEO, they're very impatient. I tell them, uh, Warren Buffett, my favorite quote from Warren Buffett is money flows from the impatient to the patient. So do candidates, so do job opportunities, uh, so do cars, houses, you know, whatever, is when you are patient, you will hire the right fit. When you're impatient, you will not. Um, it's very clear. Right. So I tell people that when I'm working with them for the first time, um, because they're having to do double duty, they're having to learn my process and then they're having to hire somebody. And that typically takes anywhere between four and six months is what I tell people. Now, are there exceptions to that? Sure. In 2016, it took me a full year to hire a senior level architect because they didn't exist at that, at that time. I mean, we had to work really hard to find that, right? Um, it also, I hired a CFO in eight days over Christmas one time because my client knew exactly what he wanted. And we put that out on the Monday before we did the first interview on Monday, the second interview on Wednesday, Christmas was on Thursday, the third interview on Friday, we did reference checks on Monday and we made a job offer. Okay. But he Exactly what he was looking. So it, it really depends on how quickly someone will learn this process as to how fast they get filled. And then after the second time, like after the first time they've utilized me after that, it never takes as long. Hmm. So, um, so may I ask you, are you sourcing candidates that are currently working? Absolutely. So now am I doing passive recruiting? Hell no. Okay. 
So oh, you're, no. you're sourcing candidates that might take a year before they decide to leave the, their current situation. Well, if it takes them a year, we probably aren't waiting for them. Okay. So how, so, like six, six months, three months? What? We're not waiting on anybody. So what okay. we, do is we post an ad and we are interviewing seven days after we post the ad, not seven business days, seven days. We move fast. We move fast as, as fast as we possibly can. And it's the single, well, my retention rate is probably the single best reason to hire me. But the second one is we move fast. And so we have an advantage over some of the larger companies that take six months to a year to hire somebody. We're not doing that. Um, so we are, so yes. what about the notification period? So like typically companies require at least two weeks notification period. Uh, to give their current employer a uh, notice that they're leaving. Oh, hmm. well, that's after they're hired. Yeah. So and, that's and, okay. And, I mean, that's okay. Oh, okay. I always support someone wanting to give two weeks notice because if we support it, we'll get it. Hmm. Exactly. That's, if we tell uh, a candidate, if I say to a candidate, oh, you want to give three weeks notice? Thumbs up. Um, I want them to leave their job Good. well. I want them to leave in an honorable way because if they do that with their previous employer, they're going to do it to us, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really exactly. I important agree. to have a clean break. And I always recommend that after they give their notice that they have at least a week between ending that relationship and starting a new one. I prefer to weeks because then they come and they've, they've reorganized their closet. They took their clothes to the cleaners. They bought food for the pantry. They got the kids in the daycare, the, the, whatever the situation they've had a little bit of downtime. They got to read a book and then they come, they have slept and then they come to your job and they are happy. They can't wait to get started. They've had a break. I mean, that's the ideal way to do this. In my I opinion, think that is beautiful. I think that's, I, I did that with one of my jobs. I got to take that vacation that I never, you know, I think we went to Cancun that week. It was refreshing, got to awesome. relax, get a little sun. Totally. And I would say that the, I, I'll never forget because then when I, I started my new job, I was like, well, it's going to take me a while to earn some PTO. So at least I got my little vacation in before Agreed. I started my new job because it took you know, a, a year and get the 28 days or whatever it was. Agreed. Yeah. So great idea. Thank you. So let's talk, you brought up one thing earlier, Beth, about that, uh, that uh, hard to find skill set. So, uh -huh. so what do you do in, in situations where you got either a, a, a real hot skill that, that is uh, hot in the marketplace or just a, that unicorn that is very difficult to find? Uh, what, what are the process you typically follow there? So there's a couple of ways around that. Um, one is, um, by creating your ideal list. The reason that I started creating ideal lists is because my clients are suffering from what I call the hiring hangover. Hmm. They have a headache. They're slightly nauseous. They're tired. Um, they, they are not interested in starting this process with me. They can't think of anything worse than to start an interview process, barf. Um, and the way, and then what happens is, because this is the law of attraction, um, and we've been talking about the law of attraction since Napoleon Hill wrote the laws of success in 1921. We've been talking for, about this for a hundred years. When you approach a process like an Eeyore, like you're hungover, you are going to attract people that are Eeyores and are hungover. Mm. It's not any fun, right? And so if you want to attract the absolute best person that you possibly can, you have to get your mindset in a place to where that person can show up. And that means when we write an ideal list, um, I have my clients print it off manually and hang it in their office to where they see it every day. Hmm. Really what I like for them to do is print it out and put it on their bedside table. So it's the last thing they see at night. I call it going to night school. You read this list, it, you know, you generate. So in other words, it's up to the client to create the vision 
for this role and to stay focused on the vision, okay? Meaning a unicorn. And if they stay focused on the vision and if they do their mindset work, that person's going to show up. So I'm having to hire a, a regulatory utility analyst. You talk about a unicorn. <laughs> we need someone with a law degree, someone that's expert in Excel, and someone who can talk to people. Okay, it's taken us. It's been we've been at it for about four and a half months. Um, I'm calling references on a guy today. Hopefully, we get to make a job offer. But he showed up. He showed up. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Every time someone shows up like a unicorn, I mean, really what I like is the more specific the unicorn is, the more fun it is for me <laughs> to go out and see what I can do. So that's, so it's vision from the client. It's my interview process. And I have a whole team of people behind me at indeed.com that have been with me for five plus years. They do the back end work on indeed to get me the people that I'm looking for. So yeah. it's really a combined, it's a team effort. I meet with my Indeed team every Tuesday morning at nine o'clock and we go over all of my searches and we go over what are we seeing from the search engine? What are people putting in for a title? Um, do we have enough keywords so that people are seeing our, and this goes back to your um, staying visible in front of people, right? Making sure that your ad is written the way it needs to be written. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that we have a quick interview process. So they apply, we're calling them in a couple of days. We're getting them in for an interview the following week and we are moving through the process is the way that we find unicorns. And I have to tell you, I think part of my success in the pandemic is people are looking for unicorns and I have a process to find unicorns. Perfect. I love it. Good Great you know, ideas. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> really, I could just, well, I'll just go back and re-listen to this recording because you brought up some very innovative things I've never thought of. Thank you. So I appreciate very, that. Very good, good job. Feedback. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We appreciate it. So, so Beth, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your your books and 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 tell and go let's let's dive into a little bit in your new book and what it's bringing out. So, let's just go through the series of of your books that you have and and what what brought you to write them and 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 uh, what are the result we get from reading each of, of these. So, um, it took me eight years, literally eight years, to write my first book, and. The reason it took so long is because I kept thinking to myself, surely somebody has already written this book. Surely someone has already put together this seven step process. Surely someone before me, we, you know, we work with really smart people. So <laughs> surely someone has already written this book before. And every time there was a new hiring book that was written, I would promptly go out and buy it and read it cover to cover, kind of frant frenetically going, did they have my process in this book? And it took me, I don't know, five or six years to realize, you know what? No one has written this book because I have to write this book. Hmm. And it took forever for me to figure that out. And so I would have these kind of panic moments at the Barnes and Noble. <laughs> the people knew me there by name. It was kind of scary. <laughs> and I would go into the business section and I would look at the hiring section at Barnes and Noble and I would stand there and I would, you know, flip through books or whatever. And I'm like, oh, my book is not even here. It's not here because I haven't written it. Hmm. So what I did was, is um, I hate to sit down and write. I mean, I'm a much more of a people person. So what I did was, is I recorded my answers and to different questions and we um, had somebody transcribe it and then we moved pieces and parts of it to where it would fit. And um, the so the seven step process, it's literally, there's an introduction. Um, chapter number one is your ideal list. Chapter number two talks about job descriptions. Chapter number three is job ads. Chapter number four is how to review resumes. And really why I advocate, if, if I had my way, no hiring manager would ever look at a resume before you interviewed somebody. Hmm. Don't do it. You have preconceived notions when you read someone's resume before you walk into an interview, and that will mess you up every single time. 
So have someone else review resumes and then you just walk into the interview. Okay, that's a side note. Then step number five, chapter number five is the first interview and the questions that I ask are in the book. This is why you ask them. This is what you're looking for. This is why it's important. Step number six is chapter six. Step number seven is chapter number seven. And then chapter number eight talks about resume review. I mean, not resume review, sorry. Um, reference checks afterwards, because I definitely um, do reference checks after that. And then it talks also about the importance of training. So what we as um, companies, we have literally quit training people. And I know why. I mean, it makes sense because if you hire somebody and you're not sure if they're going to make it or not, why would you spend all of this time, money, and energy and resources to training someone who's not going to work out? Hmm. So there's a very successful marketing firm called Chris, Crispin Porter and Baguski. They're out of business now, but they had, at, they had um, contracts with Toyota. Like they did really high-end marketing work. And I heard the VP of technology speak one time and he said his hiring process was he picked 10 resumes out of 100. He called them all in, handed them keys and laptops and said, if you're still here in 90 days, you have the job. Hmm. Wow. So if you think about that hiring process, what happens is, is that these people, they, they, they kill themselves with no training, no direction on how to make it. They stay for two years and they slug it out and then they leave and they take their intellectual property and usually their clients with them. Hmm. And they're like, F you, because where were you when I needed support? Where were you when I needed training? Where were you when I needed somebody to answer these questions for me? You set, you know, you set people up for failure. They're not, even if you, even if they become successful, they're not going to stay. They don't have any loyalty to you because you didn't for them. So it's imperative that you hire correctly and that you train them correctly. And then at that point, that's how you end up with good people. So uh, may I interject here? Beth, do you have this book in Audible? Yes. And you know what? My Audible version is uh, my college roommate and her husband are the readers of it. They are uh, producers. And he reads the actual book part. And then she reads the blogs that I've put in there. Oh, it's, I, I, it's probably which, my favorite which, version of the book. It's which the one? That's why can I hire Which people. one? The, the one with the pencils? Yes, the one with the pencils. And so Higher Power okay, has- so I'm an auditory, so. Yeah, you'll you'll love that version of the book. I, I was very proud of that. Um, higher power but has that one, not that been, one's not an audible, but the why can't I hire good people is an audible, right? Well, higher higher power has not been published yet. We haven't released it. It should happen in the next four to six weeks. But I don't have an audible version okay. of that one yet. Uh, just the first one. Okay, no worries. Quickly well, I'll just get the I'll get the why can't I hire good people. And, and maybe I'll uh, I'll just uh, gift that to my my leaders because I, I have six uh, people leaders and and a director. Thank you. So that will be a good one. I that. feel like the book should just be in every like new packet. <laughs> you know, when you like, <laughs> start a new job and they give you the packet with all the like, <laughs> you know the employee handbooks, it should just <laughs> slip slip it right on in there. <laughs> well, you know, I mean that brings up a really good point. We, um, so there's a book called Hiring the Best by a guy named That's Mark a Yeh, and, and he wrote it in 1994. And in his prologue, he talks about interviewing being a dirty secret. Hmm. So if you think about that, we, we hire hiring managers, we expect for them to put a, a team of people together, we hold them accountable for that team. We do not train them on what to look for in an interview and why it's important. So every hiring manager out there is needing this skill set and they don't get it. Um, it's, it's really appalling um, in a lot of ways because we're, we're setting them up for failure. Anyway, I, on that note, I will step off my soapbox. So 
Uh, Jules, did you have a question for me? I'm sorry. No, no, I was just actually gonna just jump in here real quick because we've got about like nine-ish minutes left. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to remind everyone uh, listening, if you have any last minute questions for Beth, please drop them in the chat so we can get those answered for you. And um, I, I mean, I, I just, there's so many great takeaways here. I just love that you're talking about like energy that if you want to attract something good and a great candidate, you have to step up to that too. You can't expect you're going to get the best if you're a, you know, miserable person. That's right. Bad vibes, you know, no, no one's going to want to work for, for that, you know, nope. especially now, like you say with remote, I mean, people can work anywhere for companies in other countries or like states. It's just, it's opened up a whole different world for em employees as well. So you right. really have to bring the best as well. Then, and, and that's how, you know, it's, it's like dream team that way. Yeah, totally. I would agree with you. And it's I'm impressed because I, I have a lot of experience and I learned a lot of things from you. So thank you. I appreciate fantastic. that. Feedback. It's yeah. really, uh, it's really cool. Very innovative. Thank you. Okay, so as we uh, allow any kind of questions to come in for the, the last minute, I just want to uh, point out and uh, recognize our sponsor here, TMA. And so TMA does uh, uh, talent assessments and, and helps uh, and managers understand their people more and, and so forth. And so if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about the TMA and how it can help you and your company, uh, please feel free to, to sign up for a, uh, a quick uh, well, actually, we, we, well, we can give you a, a quick um, assessment and you can take that yourself. I'm going to go ahead and launch a, a poll here. And there's a, if you select, a, if you'd like to see what the TMA assessment is all about, it's time for that. And I'll send you one of those assessments. Or if you'd like to uh, have time with any of our, our professionals on, on, the, on, on here, whether it be Beth or Shar or Jules or myself, uh, feel free to um, uh, set up some time and, and we'll get you in connection with those people. So also, uh, Jules, do you want to tell us or, or uh, about next week? Uh, let us know a little bit about our speaker next week here? Yeah, for sure. So next week, I hope you'll join us again. It's actually cool. We're seeing, I'm seeing some of the same names popping up. So I'm loving the consistency, like we were talking about with Beth a little earlier. It's the consistent ones that get ahead in life. So uh, good on to the people that are showing up. Um, so next week, we actually have Kimberly Arnold, and she is a leadership coach. And she, what she does is she helps companies discover their mission and their vision. And she helps align that into employee performance. So the session will be called From Strategy to Employee Performance. And um, it's going to be kind of centered around what we're experiencing now, how things have changed with COVID, obviously. So um, she'll be uh, hopping on next week. So hopefully you can join us then as well. Great. Thanks, Thank Jules, for that. Well, Beth, this has been a, a great conversation. Thank you so much. I, 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 I'm so glad that we were able to fit this in and, and uh, yes. have you on because I know you're just a, 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 for, a powerful presence in this, in this area. So thank, thank you so you. much for sharing your knowledge. Oh, uh, thanks for having me, Sam. I really appreciated the opportunity and, um, and you know how much I adore you. So I just <laughs> appreciate being here. So thank you. Thank it's you great. so much. Yeah, thank you. Love having you back. Yeah, thanks thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. I'll get your book. I'll get your audio. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Shar. I appreciate the support. <laughs> Put it in the flag bag. Yeah. yeah. And I like my it. List beside my bed. I, I love it. it. I, I joined like a business mastermind last year. And oh. And, you know, I feel like, I mean, my love language isn't really gifts, but, uh, you know, everyone <laughs> likes to have a box sent to their home full of like goodies. But there was a really good book, um, Building a Story Brand, I think it's called Donald Miller. And um, so it talks about like how to build a brand and, and getting that book. I was like, it just showed that they, they cared enough that they want us to succeed and that this is the extra homework we could do before we even got started. So, yeah, I, I think like slipping in a book. It, it, it works. <laughs> for I, I, so agree, Jules. I think that's a great idea too. Awesome ideas. And then Sam, you'll be next because you know you're you're on the book path as well. That's right. I got to get my book out. That's right. Yeah, yeah, but he reads the real ones. He reads the hardcovers. <laughs> I, I, just, I just listen to him. <laughs> I listen to the books too. It's good. I love Audible. Okay. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, and I uh, look forward to seeing everyone next week. And, and thank you so much, Beth. Yeah, thank you, Sam. All right. Bye. All right, cheers. Thank you, guys. Bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you.